Welcome to this special edition of the local campaign here on Rogers TV. The upcoming election on October 24th is probably one of the most compelling elections in, in many, many years for many different reasons. And we wanted to take this opportunity to speak to some of the councillors that are not running for a re-election, have decided not to run for re-election. And my guest today is Matthew Fleury from the Rideau Vanier Ward. Matthew, welcome. Thanks so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Oh, come on. Thanks. Thanks for hosting this. I applaud the initiative and, and looking forward to our chat today. And here we are in Councillor's Lounge, oh. which is my understanding that it's not used very often. Not the last two years. <laughs> There's been nothing well, at City Hall. Well, that's for sure. That's for sure. I, I, yeah. was, uh, I was one of the unique offices. I don't have a constituency office, so I'm, I'm, my community's right uh, on the other side of the canal here. Right. And uh, spent a lot of time alone in that <laughs> office behind Zoom screens. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people were, were first and foremost surprised that you, you've decided not to run for re-election. Uh, not only that, but also surprised that you decided not to run for mayor. Let, let's break that down a little bit and, and talk about that decision and, and why you made it. Well, look, I, uh, I've been blessed, right? I, I came out of university after my master's, ran for office and won uh, at the age of 24 in 2010. Six, three elections later, uh, 12 years of experience on council. Um, it was, to me, after the last election, I had decided that I was not going to run as a councillor and, and I was going to take one of two paths, either run for mayor or exiting politics for the time being. I was organizing. Uh, if, if, you, if you and I had this chat uh, late in the year or at the beginning of the year, I, absolutely, we were getting ready. And, you know, a number of things happened. Um, that uh, just made it obvious for me. I have a young family, I have a five-year-old. We want a second child uh, in, in coming months. And, um, you know, uh, I've, I've also, I recognize the, the political period we're in. It's very challenging. It's very yeah. demanding. Uh, there are a lot of polarization. I, there's a lot more unity than people give it credit. But there's a lot of, of divisions. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's an opportunity to bring new, fresh faces. I'm young. I'm 36. Yeah. I'm going to go out, discover the world, learn, uh, and maybe one day have an opportunity to come back, right? And that, that's what I'm, uh, I'm certainly not uh, sad in, in, uh, in leaving. I mean, it's, it's always difficult because in an elected office, usually, usually it's, it's like sports. You, the, the electorate shows you the door or you die in office, right? It's, right. it's usually yeah. one of yeah. two ways. It's, it's rare that you, as an elected official, you get the opportunity to decide. And in this case, uh, being so young, I, I, I have many years ahead of me and, and likely will be in politics one day, uh, one day, but for now it's a little pause. That's interesting because you've, you've hinted at that a couple of times of coming back to politics. It's in my blood, right? It's, well, yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering on a municipal level or would you, are, are you even considering moving on to uh, another level of government? Um, it, very interesting, like for the, I, I'm speaking in what, where I'm at today, things yeah. change, right? So it's important, yeah. it is important to say, uh, I'm, I'm not a very partisan person. That's why I like municipal level. Yeah. Uh, it's very tangible what we do. We debate things locally. We see investments locally. Um, I don't know how I would fit in a party where you have, you know, media lines that you have to follow and, yeah. and stick to. Uh, I've been independent in that space for 12 years, which, uh, which has been fun and w which I cherish, frankly. Matthew, we've seen a lot of councillors make the same decision, and I wonder if part of that decision, uh, you touched on it as well, it, it, it's been a difficult term, yeah. right, for many reasons. I, you know, number one is, is the pandemic, and you, you just, one thing after another, the light rail system, the convoy, some of those reasons, uh, it, 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 did, did that, that affect your decision? Absolutely. How difficult it was? Absolutely. Um, I, when, I, when I knock on doors meeting residents, I listen and I, ultimately I make commitments. And I try to, do, to stay true to those objectives. Um, and, and in many ways I have. But keeping that while so many crises are happening, I mean, I'm coming back pre this term. I mean, since 2015, Rideau Street sinkhole. Yeah. It's in my area, mm -hmm. right? Then the 2017 events, all positive, but the logistics behind that were quite complex. You go into tornadoes, uh, floods, you go into the convoy. I'm certainly not complaining. I, yeah. It is my yeah. duty and responsibility uh, to respond, but as chair of OCH, it's not just my neighborhood. O Ottawa Community Housing has properties across the city, 
and all of those have directly impacted our tenants. So I was involved in the crisis response for all of these. So um, I, I just think it's the right time. I think there is a, a period of time. I came in in, in, uh, in an era where you know, Mayor Watson was first coming back to the municipal level. There's an, a, a fresh air, a fresh energy of strong governance and ethics and so on. And 12 years later, I mean, we've had challenges. We've had recent yeah. challenges with the, the situation with, with LRT, with the, the governance in the capital. We, obviously, the pandemic has exposed a number of, of real struggles as a large city in terms of mental health, addictions, housing issues. So I'm certainly not walking away. I'm a resident of Ottawa. I yeah. want to help my city. It's just, uh, for me personally, I, I need to take a bit of a, a step back from politics. I know you're very passionate about housing. I, I've heard you speak on it many, many times. What, what, what's the missing piece when it comes to affordable housing? I think the frustration a lot of people have is they think that they feel that the developers have all the power and the city has very little power or the city's giving the developers too much power. Where's the balance, and, and you know what, what's your opinion on, on how to solve this affordable housing situation? Hard to give you an answer because it's such a complex sphere, but I'll try to simplify it. Okay. Residents in Ottawa and in the capital city want a, a society where everyone has an opportunity to live where they want to live and the type of, of, of accommodations that are appropriate and affordable for them, whatever that range is. Right. We're fortunate. We have all this public land all this national capital land that would be owned by MTO, that would be owned by the city, that would be owned by the feds, the NCC, and yet we're not great at leveraging that for our own goals. So we always turn back to the private sector and, and, and try to put the pressure there in terms of those, uh, those developments. I think the, the truth is somewhere in between, right, where the fundamentals are wrong. If, if we want to create affordability, it's not with home ownership. And we have to be honest right. about these yeah. things. No, you're right. Some of the strongest, you look at North America is not a good example of that. Most people strive for home ownership and it's a form of equity and they, it's an investment and they're able to, to, to get major returns, especially the last 20 years have been like that. Certainly when my parents bought their first house in 93, it, the interest rates at 18% made a different reality. Right. The last 20 years have shown us differently. That said, when you look at across, across North America, Montreal is the keen example of surviving the, the affordability issue because 66% of folks rent. Yeah, and it, it, really is a strange, it really is strange, an addiction, you know, speaking to you know, financial planners and real estate agents over the years, it's a strange addiction in North America that, that we have when it comes to housing. We think the only option is, is buying a home, where you look at Europe, in Montreal as, as the example, yeah. I, I think you're right. right? So I we, think some of the, the fundamentals are a little skewed, which creates this environment. One thing I will tell you is that council can do a lot of things. It can't do anything about home affordability after the first purchaser. Right. So someone, right. We, make, we make all yeah. efforts to make yeah. this unit or this home affordable for purchase. I, I, just to walk you through the problem here. And once that house is in the market, then it's a private property. How do you ever control that? So I think that's where the rental market's more enticing. The governments can bring r rent supplements. It can bring programs into existing, afford existing rental to make it affordable. Uh, you mentioned the, the division that we've seen in this t term in, in particular, and there's this idea of, of the Watson Club and you know the, those opposed to the Watson Club. Where, where does this division come from? Complex. I mean, I, I think the, the mayor certainly has made a, a life in public service, 30 years plus, have done tremendous work. Uh, I respect him. Uh, but you, you get to a point in age where the majority of residents and family life is in between 30, you know, 20 to 60 years old. And then we, you get close to 60, well, your perception of how life is for a 30-year-old is maybe different. So I think society has really, really changed over the last four or five years and I think governments with not not the mayor specifically but I think the demographic of you know uh, white male 60 plus is like whoa what's happening the the world's changed around them it's very tough for 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 that to stay on top of it it's certainly not I like Jim I have no problem with yeah, him. yeah. I just yeah. there are some philosophical things that I'm like hey we have a d generational perspective, a generational difference on how to do things, and 
I'm just, I have a young family, I'm invested here, I grew up here, I want to make sure that uh, we plan for the future, not just for tomorrow. Yeah, and how do we attract that younger, younger demographic to get interested in, in, in politics, and in municipal politics in particular? You mentioned it earlier, and it's something I've always said, uh, municipal politics affects us more than any other level of, of government, yet the voter turnout is, is, is horrible. Yeah. Um, for, for, for young people that may have a notion of, you know what, I, younger people, I guess I should say, may have a notion of getting into politics, what, what would your advice be? And, and I, I'm going to jump in just to make sure I'm not misinterpreted by, by those listening. Those who've contributed to our city, who are seniors, deserve to be listened, deserve to have a voice. Oh, voters. absolutely. I, and I'm yeah. not saying, I, my, my comment around the political generation is not relating to that. I think there's a space for everyone to contribute. I just, I think the society is heading in a different way. I think uh, from a young perspective, how to get folks involved, families, I think we have to get, demonstrate value, right? And, and, and demonstrate uh, modernization. Recently, I'll give you an example, uh, families were registering for aquatic, uh, aquatic oh, programs. Yes. Yeah. I used to be a city lifeguard. Now I'm, I'm that parent behind the screen waiting at 9 p.m. for registration. I think residents are expecting a modern way to register and not having to waste an evening of their lives and scramble and on wait lists and so on. Um, th that's the type of, I think, element that would bring value to residents. And from a resident engagement point of view, I think it's uh, cities are home, but communities are even closer. Get yeah. involved in your yeah. community association. Get involved in your BIA. Join a, a volunteer board. We're very fortunate in Ottawa, and, and we underplay it. Our, our sports community, our local sports community, is thriving because of parent volunteers and yeah. administrators. Always has. Always has. Right. And, and our cultural community is the same, uh, and, and arts community is the same. So how do you get that energy that's happening within sectors and bring that to City Hall with that perspective? I think that's more enticing. I think for someone to sit at home today, listen to me and say, I want to make a difference in my city, and then thinking they could show up at City Hall and make a difference. You gotta learn, you gotta yeah. you have a lot. Like I've been, I'm a bit of a unique beast growing up in Ottawa, playing sports in Ottawa, going to school in Ottawa, working for the city of Ottawa for 10 years in aquatics. I had, a, a, I had a, an inside view in a lot of these things that I, just by the nature of growing up in one spot, I got to learn, right? So, but I don't think, I think the uniqueness of Ottawa with its urban area, rural areas, thriving suburbs, um, with uh, the, the, the sports and arts community. I think there's so much to get involved in. And through that, you can do active lobbying, active politics. And, and if, if politics is your thing, then great, learn, put your name on a ballot, and, and listen. Because we talk a lot as elected officials in front of the screen, but the, the majority of time we're listening to residents, we're listening to right. businesses, we're reading reports, and through that we shape our, uh, our interventions. Well, and, and you know, speaking on that, the dynamic has changed with that as well, right? Where you'd get phone calls and you'd get emails, but now we have social media right on top of it. Yeah. it it, to me, seems like you know, it's, it's a 24-7 job now. Is that... Is that your feeling? Is that, is that one of the reasons why you've decided to step back as well? And that's well? my own doing. I, I, I've learned in politics. I mean, you're very active. <laughs> Listen, you got videos. You're, you answer to everybody. I've seen you on Facebook and on, on Twitter. I mean, that... And you see that as a resident, eh? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. exhausting, though, You, you know, um, I, I... And I have a lot of respect for our mayor. I've learned the, the, pol the local politics through him in many ways. And he goes to the opening of Envelope. He'll say that. I've learned in that space, right? I, I go to every event, I want to be there, I want to be active. I, looking now with a young family, I do it differently. Right. But, but how do you do it differently when you've done this, you know, very active through the last 12 years? And, and frankly, that's what I like the most about the job, is meeting folks, is talking to folks, is hearing what they're working on, hearing the challenges. The pandemic has stripped that out, right? Where right. I used to have direct contacts, you can't get the same type of informal, checking in on people, conversations through Zoom calls. You just can't, yeah. right? So yeah. um, it's certainly part of the reasons, but it, it, we've made it, elected officials like me have made it that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, let, let's talk about, you know, one of the biggest files, and that is the LRT. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had some bad luck, and, and quite frankly, we've had bad service, bad equipment. 
This idea of, the, of, of a P3 contract is, is getting a lot of criticism. Um, I talked to Mayor Watson about it as well, and he, he made some compelling arguments, but I'd like to get your, you know, the benefit of hindsight, going back, would you have done, would, would you have said, you know, yeah, this is a, th these P3 contracts are a good idea. Well, what do you think? I, I think it's important to, it's, I think it's important for Ottawa and the capital to start building the, the mindset that we can do things. The but can we? We can't build a light rail well, system. Well, we, we did 2017, we did Lansdowne, we want to do Le Breton, we want to do the Byward Market. There's a bunch of things we want to do, but sure. are we doing them? And that, that's, that, you know, that's where... But, but you have to hire someone to do the work, yeah. right? So, so in, that, in that space, you know, a lot of people have lost sight of why did we do the LRT in the first place. And I'll give you what is my perspective, there's a lot out there. Yeah. During the afternoon peak period, if you'd stood on Albert and Slater, starting at the Rideau Center, the, the National uh, Defense Headquarters, you couldn't pass more buses per second oh, yeah. between, you know, Rideau Center and Bronson. Yeah. So you had to go underground because you had all, you have all these cross streets: Metcalf, O'Connor, Bank, Lady Line. So okay, you're going to go underground. Might as well improve the infrastructure. That's the mind. That's what led into Phase One. And then if you're going to do Phase One, you might as well not. If you're going to do this hub and spoke model, you might as well get into communities. And and the Phase Two gets us to 75% of residents of Ottawa will be less than five kilometers away. So the, these two principles I buy into. Yeah, oh yeah, the principle is great. The mechanics of how do you do it, we know that private sector builds cheaper and faster than we can. It costs a lot of money for the city to go and build its own recreation center, it does. So is the P3 good for a capital project? Yes. Are P3s good for operating? No. Because you're a private business, you have to make money, so you're cutting corners. We've learned the hard way through aquatics facilities, uh, the, old, um, the old facility uh, in, in Orleans, uh, Ray Friel, which was privately yeah. owned and it collapsed. It didn't work, the P3, because they couldn't make money. I, I see the LRT a bit like that. We try, okay. we try to package something massive. Ultimately, uh, elected office uh, uh, holders and OC Transpo in the city have reputational uh, uh, challenges and are accountable to the system working day in, day out. It's not working. You know, OC Transpo gets buses on the road every day and there's no challenges. So how do we get there? So I agree with you that the, the stretch, the way we stretch the P3 is not working and it's playing out in court. So I have to be careful on, on where that's going to land. But uh, ultimately, I think we, we, uh, the investments in public transit is important and we can't lose sight of that. The internal politicking of funding and P3s and city operator or not, it needs to be resolved. There's no question. Let's, let's go into your ward in, in particular, Rideau Vanier. Best spot, best spot in the, in the community. <laughs> really? Yeah. You feel that yeah. way? Yeah. So, Come on, San Diego or Town Vanier. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but I mean, it, it, uh, each ward is unique for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to talk about, you know, what, what you, some of the things you're most proud of. Let's, let's talk about some of the highlights. You know, we, I hate all, only talking about negatives. negatives. There's been a lot of positives. Yep. Um, what, what do you put at the top of that list? I mean, maybe there's not one thing, but maybe there's a two or three. You know, I, I prepared for the interview because you, 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 know, you look at it. And for me, citywide, you say, like, Fleury, what did you do citywide? If people that follow, follow me at committee and council know that I, I pass a lot of motions and move things that are important, those things have implication over your generation. So when you see a sidewalk not patched in an asphalt in the next few years and it's properly repaired in concrete, I'll take no credit, I don't need a stamp, but those are the types of policies that I've been able to work through that will okay. improve our city overall. Citywide things that matter to me are Ottawa Community Housing. Ottawa Community Housing is now able, and we're in design and construction of a thousand units. We want to be like that for the next 10 years. So it's, we've positioned, OCH is able to deliver. Is the city and provincial government going to fund so that we're able every year to be able to achieve that? Again, you're going to say, well, what's the accomplishment there? The accomplishment is OCH had not built more than 100 units since 1973. So we're now in position to build 1,000 units. So you could see a lot of work went into governance, funding, looking at our properties and what could be developed, the land we own, land we acquire. So a lot of work, uh, a lot of work in that space. Does that work monetarily? I just mean, you know, uh, from a taxpayer's perspective, if they're thinking, okay, you know, we're putting money, you know, with, with, with rents and so forth that, that, that get paid, does, does that money get paid back? You know? I, I'm simplifying our, our cost of building, land, and, and construction. Right. We own the land, so zero cost. Yeah, yeah. 
So we're only dealing with construction and what's happening is that some of our properties, particularly townhouses, are not performing well. Okay. They're, in, they're 60, 50 years old. Yeah. Uh, they weren't built to the standards that we have today. They're energy guzzlers, if you will. They take a lot of energy. So on Gladstone, Booth and Gladstone, we had two-story stack towns. Yeah, I know That's an eight-story building now. So we've, we've modernized the offer and we've increased the offer uh, in terms of units. So that's where OCH is going. Our, our key communities where we're going to focus is Overbrook, 700 uh, townhouses that are going to be redeveloped and foster farms right across from the Ikea. Oh yeah, um, yeah. We have a, a large community. There's unique opportunities to, and obviously uh, as federal government releases land, former Rockcliffe Base, they're looking at Heron Road, Baseline, the former CBC site, we're, we're, we're right in there. Like right now we have okay. a, a partnership with ZB on, um, on, on doing affordable housing through OCH in that space. Uh, the other one is the Byron Market Public Realm. So the Byward market okay. has, has seen its up and down. I think it's on a, unfortunately, has seen a downtrend for, for a generation now. We have the right governance, Ottawa markets, merging with the Byward BIA to look at the space, to program the space, to, to have the right mindset and, and abilities. And then we've approved, council has, uh, the public round plan. So what does the urban spaces need to look like in the market? And the cost is two main streets. So for $150 million, you redo the market. Right. We, we've done all the background work. It's ready to execute. And I hope next, next council will do that. Do I own that as a legacy? No, but I'm proud because, you know, to Well, me you're those, part of this new task force, right? Exactly. Yes, sir, Nakvi, uh, he and I spoke in this revitalization task force for the downtown. And I, I think what, what's interesting, and you can speak on this, Matthew, is the idea of um, yeah, tourists come down here. That's all well and good. We love tourism. Uh, you know, it, it's one of the it's the one of the biggest economic drivers, right? People still love going to Parliament Hill and taking their pictures and so forth. But for residents of Ottawa, what do we do so that people from Canada and Orleans and Barhaven they want to come downtown? Yeah. And I'm not putting downtown. You know, I'm not putting it down in any way. No. There are wonderful restaurants and retail, local Absolutely. businesses, small businesses. But what's missing? Um, residents, uh, like yeah. especially in that, like I, I represent east of the canal, so it's much more with the university campus, with residences, mm -hmm. businesses, it's, it's very different. But in the center town piece, which I'm on the task force that Yasser created, uh, it's, it's, there's a lack of people living there. There's, you're starting to see that on the western edge near Bronson, but the office towers, if you don't have the Monday to Friday commuting heavily day in, day out, then you can't generate the, the, the yeah. revenue for And that's not coming back. back. It's not. Right. So the, the opportunity are, are wide ranging of making sure folks come back. But I take a, a broader view and, and I'm bringing you somewhere else. For downtown to thrive, you need three communities to thrive. Okay. And you need those three communities to work in sync. You need Lansdowne to work, you need Byward Market to work, and you need Le Breton to yes. develop and work. Yeah. Once those three communities, the Sens are playing, the Red Blacks are playing, there's a concert at the NAC, and, and the transportation between those, those uh, three pillars work, wow. It doesn't matter that you live in Gatineau or Barhaven, you're going to come downtown because it's a vibrant hub. So I think we've, Le Breton, Le Lansdowne is on, is on its right track, Le Breton shows bright lights, the market needs the infrastructure. So, you know, I, 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 I really entice all levels of government, all communities to work together to unlock those, what I think are the three pillars of making Ottawa vibrant. Yeah, re residential, I think, is, is the number one, right? I agree. People that, you know, we need more people living downtown to, to make it thrive. And, um, you were coming, uh, you were saying the question before, and I, I know I was a bit long-winded, but in, in the community, there are really two areas that I'm most proud of in our community. Okay. Adawi Bridge. Yeah. Connecting yeah. Vanny and, and, and uh, Sandy Hill. You know, I, I used to put the bike on my shoulder and cross the Rideau <laughs> River there, so now that's yeah. a permanent attribute. And then the investments in parks. We've, we've redone parks up Smith uh, off of Beechwood, Jules Marais in Lower Town, and River Rain uh, in Vanier. Parks bring communities together. If mm -hmm. you create those spaces, you have a lot more synergies, neighbors speaking to, to neighbors and, and connecting that way, so I'm really proud of that. Regrets. Any, uh, any regrets that come to mind? Uh, it, so, so I want to be open about who I am. I'm not perfect, and why I'm able to take criticisms in the news or in the communities because I'm 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 my biggest critic. So you know I could go anywhere and, and 
there's a lot of votes or things I've said or, you know, in time things don't age well necessarily. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that's why people respect me because I'm, I'm, I don't hide, I don't try to move, pivot or whatever. I, I, I can own where, where I do something wrong. I, one of the things I think I could have started off better, um, I think it's certainly clear and we're going to continue to oppose it and, and block it, but um, the Salvation Army, when they came and presented to me initial ideas of what they wanted to do, um, I, was, I felt I was under an NDA. And I was by the code of conduct of an elected official. Right. But the way things unfolded afterwards, I would have lost nothing of leaking it early and saying, this has to stop, we have to block it in, and creating momentum much earlier than when they submitted for the mega shelter in Vanny. Well, now, what's the problem with that project, do you think? Well, uh, <clears throat> in your opinion, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, residents will tell you, fix the market. And part of the market challenges is a concentration of shelters. Mm -hmm. And when they think about it, that space, they don't think about it much deeper than that. They just, oh, well, move the shelter. Well, the model doesn't work. It hasn't worked in the market. It won't work in any other, in any other community. And we've seen transitions in, in American cities and Canadian cities of investing in housing, affordable housing, where someone is on the street, you don't put them in a shelter. You put them in, with a key to a unit and you bring the supports that are needed for addictions, mental health, and employment. Um, so for me, creating the model, expanding that shelter model, which is shown to be broken, which is quite expensive. Yeah, the city's yeah. spending $34 million a year on motels and shelters, spending barely $15 million on new housing. Mm. You, yeah. you want folks to have affordable housing, yeah. yet you're investing less than what you're doing. So that, that's been a criticism I have. You know, you yeah. call it a housing crisis, and it's a pittance, com, you know, in your budget. We're a four right? billion dollar corporation, yeah. putting start, 15 start, million bucks into housing. You know, and I have tons of solutions. Harris downloaded a lot of things to cities. McGinty uploaded stuff. There's one thing that they both did wrong, which is RGI. RGI is, is when you're, you're low income, your rent gear to income level in, in housing is adjusted for your revenue. Every year, the city of Ottawa, you and I paying our property tax and residents are paying $80 million to, pro, to support a provincial program. Right. right. That should be uploaded. Imagine if just that alone, the, the province took that 80 million of RGI because it's an important program mm -hmm. back. And if as a city, we committed $80 million of new affordable housing every year, how that would change the landscape within you know, three, four, five years. Yeah, I mean, not an easy thing. I'm, I think I'm about yeah, down to 60, 60 seconds, seconds here. Uh, immediate future plans. I don't know. Lots of opportunities. For me, it's finding the right one. Uh, I want to continue to contribute to my community. I want to continue to be active. And I don't want to close the door to future politics. So I'm, I'm strategic about that. But I've not signed a contract. Uh, this, this, <laughs> okay. this November, um, I, I, I will see as opportunity comes. I, I would like to stay engaged. I have a lot of energy, and I, I, I have a lot to learn. Well, certainly looking forward to, to seeing what your, your next journey, your next adventure is. Uh, thanks so much for spending time with us, Matthew. And, and, and thanks for all your work, regardless of how anybody feels. You know, I have the greatest respect for uh, people that get into politics, and in particular, municipal politics. So um, really appreciate everything that you've done over the years. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome.